How's a low-cost thrift in consignment? The worst part about insomnia is the boredom. Nothing open except for the seedy places. Nobody awake except for the seedy people. Nothing to do except watch movies and eat sunflower seeds. Seriously, screw insomnia. My sleep capacity generally comes and goes in waves, but the few weeks before I found Hal's were especially rough. There was no inciting incident, just that general feeling of restlessness and anxiety that has become a familiar friend over the years. I tried all the standard things. More milk, old movies, I even cut down on my caffeine intake. All the usual things that people recommend but never work. Eventually, more out of boredom than anything else, I took to taking late night walks through the city. I worked a crappy job as a projectionist at a local movie theater, and on the weekends I didn't often get off work until the last movie was finished, and the city had long since wound down by the time I was free. The first week or two I stayed towards the well-lit areas populated by the intoxicated, both rich and poor. But while the people watching was always good, I quickly grew tired of the relentless noise and began wandering off the beaten path. I'm not too sure how I'd never noticed Hal's before. I distinctly remembered buying smokes at the dilapidated gas station across the street on several occasions, and I'm sure my eyes would have been drawn to the large storefront windows still brightly lit and welcoming at 3am. The neon sign, pronouncing it, Hal's low-cost thrift and consignment glowed in garishly conflicting colors, except for the first S which was burnt out. Of course, I would come to realize that there were very good reasons I had never seen it before, but that first night I wondered if maybe I was hallucinating from sleep deprivation. I entered, of course. Even if I didn't feel the need to validate that the whole thing wasn't just a figment of my imagination, there was no way I was denying my curiosity. It was probably the smell that I noticed first, kind of a combination of burning sage and rancid meat, but in a weirdly good kind of way. The best thing I can compare it to was a beach bonfire at low tide. The place was packed full of merchandise, all displayed very neatly on row after row of shelving but without any sign of clear organization. Knickknacks sat on the same shelves as old magazines and jumper cables. A bizarre collection of artwork decorated the walls, from shadow boxes holding sports paraphernalia to Pink Floyd posters, to copies of famous impressionist paintings. The wall, furthest from the front entrance, was actually just an unbroken line of doors. Each door was crafted in an entirely different style and each painted a different color to create a full-length pride flag along the wall. In the center, the green door actually appeared to be an elevator, which really just raised additional questions. I began to browse the first aisle to the left of the front door. A full silver-plated dining set, a clown costume, a chainsaw without a chain, four cookbooks, a Super Soaker XP100 already filled with water, several fake antique-looking religious relics such as crosses and Buddha's heads, and a full-length evening cloak that made me immediately start contemplating a career as a supervillain if for no other reason than I would look amazing in it. I browsed several more aisles with a bemused smile on my face as the truly eclectic inventory continued to defy any clear organizational sense, until a gruff voice cleared its throat. I glanced up to see the shopkeeper behind the front counter staring at me. He was a medium-sized man, but held a clear, don't mess with me, or around him. His head was shaped bald, and his arms and shoulders indicated someone who had spent more than a few years working in trades. Can I help you find something? He asked, his voice a low grumble that ran the line between professionalism and wanting to throw you out to the curb. I shot him one of my patent and disarming smiles. Not really, I'm just browsing. He continued to stare for a moment, his eyes probing as if searching for a way to sort me into one of the Jungian archetypes that all retail employees have for their customers. Incubus? He asked, finally. Excuse me? Are you an Incubus? He responded, his eyes still searching mine. No. Gemini, actually. Well, on the cusp of cancer, really. I didn't think people actually use the astrology pickup in real life. I gotta ask, do you get a lot of success with that one? With nostalgia being all the rage these days, going for one of the classic pickup lines is actually a brilliant idea. The corner of the man's mouth twitched for just a moment before returning to its painted on scowl. That immediately put me at ease. Couldn't work the late night shift without having that hard shell of an exterior, but if I could touch a sense of humor, he probably wouldn't be throwing me out anytime soon. I don't get a lot of people coming in here just to browse, he said, his voice had moving slightly away from the gravelly grumble he was using before. Less Bob Dylan, more Bob's Burgers. Most know exactly what they want by the time they lay eyes on this place. I shrugged. What can I say? I'm an impulsive sort. Hey, how much is this? I lifted up a snow globe that held what looked like a large hospital. The shopkeeper raised an eyebrow. Good eye. That's $200. I whistled, immediately placing it carefully back on the rack. Pricey for a paperweight. 
Collector's item. There are a lot of stories inside that little snow globe. You could probably get a couple thousand from the right buyer if you're fine dealing with that kind of person. I take it since you're selling it for $200, you're not fine with that. The corner of the shopkeeper's mouth twitched again. I could tell he was warming to me. I'm pretty sure you're not here for that old thing anyways. What am I here for then? I'm not sure yet. Keep browsing, I'm sure you'll find it. I did as I was told. An antique set of writing quills, what looked like a defunct Tesla coil, a compass, and a sextant, a typewriter, a VCR, a few old board games I had never heard of, and a few other raggedy children's toys, including an actual raggedy Ann doll. Nothing really struck my fancy until I was flipping through a rack of clothing and came across a treasure. I delightedly snatched it up and approached the front counter, placing it in front of the shopkeeper. He raised another eyebrow at me, and I beamed a smile at him in return. I've always wanted one of these, I chortled. The shopkeep shook his head and pressed a few buttons on the archaic register. Not Fay then. Never met a Fay with a decent sense of humor. For the white t-shirt with the I'm with stupid written on it, that'll be a buck fifty-three. I fished a handful of coins out of my pocket and counted out exact change. He took it and sorted the money into the correct slots. He looked back up at me and shook his head. This has got to be the dumbest sale I've made this year. I'm not even sure why that was on the rack. Hey, I'm not complaining. I said, pulling the new purchase over the shirt I was already wearing. Did you just open? I walk by this area pretty often, and I'm sure I've never seen you here before. The man's smile came out fully into the open. Yes and no. We've been in business for a long time, but I guess you could say we're new to the area. Well, I hope you stick around for a while, Hal, I said, nodding with a faint understanding as I extended my hand. You've got a bunch of weird crap in here, and there aren't many other places for me to go shopping at this time of night. Butch, the shopkeeper replied, shaking my outstretched hand. Excuse me? My name's Butch, not Hal. What the hell would the owner be doing working the front counter at 3am? I threw my head back and laughed. I stand corrected. Butch grinned. So not an incubus, not a fay, not a vamp. What the hell are you doing in my shop? I raised an eyebrow. Buying vintage clothing, apparently. No, seriously, what's your deal? Shapeshifter? Wendigo? Cannibal? Dude, I've worked enough retail to know all about the normal customer archetypes, but I think you've lost me on these. Is a shapeshifter one of those shoplifters who keeps showing up in different clothes like they're actually fooling anyone? Butch looked at me in perplexity, but a little bell rang announcing the arrival of another customer before he could continue his line of questioning. We both glanced towards the door instinctually, and I suddenly also began wondering what the hell I was doing in the store. The woman who had just entered was tall, disturbingly tall, at least that was my first impression. I soon realized though that she wasn't actually tall, she was just floating a solid two feet off the ground. She wore a long, pale white and semi-transparent dress that fell clearly past her feet and dragged gently on the floor. A white veil was pinned to her unkempt mane of dark hair and spread across her face. That veil did nothing to disguise the bloodshot and sorrowful eyes, the broken nose, nor the mouth that hung open to the center of her chest, leaving a large black void from her cracked and broken top teeth to well past her neck. I recoiled in horror, slipping and falling directly onto my butt, before scooting myself back until my back hit a rack of shelves and a hairy, taxidermized hand fell into my lap. I held it up in preparation to do battle should I need to. The specter, however, paid me absolutely no mind. She merely glided down one of the aisles, raised her hand to delicately select something off a shelf, and then floated back up to Butch's counter. Evening, Maeve. Just a usual? Butch asked casually. The woman's cavernous mouth seemed to open wider, and a reverberating moan began to vibrate my soul. It wasn't loud, but it suddenly reminded me of the sound I heard my mother make over my grandfather's deathbed when I was nine years old. Alright, gorgeous. It's 4.50. The woman in white reached out a hand limply and dropped a handful of crumpled bills on the counter. She then turned and slowly glided out the door. My shaking hands continued to point the furry limiter long past the point she was out of sight. Throat lozenges, said Butch. I swept the leg to point at him, my heart still racing and my eyes wide. Butch seemed unconcerned. Maeve comes in every night for her pack. Her work leaves her throat pretty sore. I'm not sure if they do much good, but it's always the regulars who keep a business afloat. That was a freaking banshee! I almost screamed. Butch's eyebrows raised as though impressed. Huh, <laughs> wow, he said. I'm impressed. Most humans wouldn't recognize one on sight. Hey. Could you stop pointing that thing at me? I can get a little unpredictable if you're not used to them. I kept my impromptu weapon trained on him for another moment before allowing my hand, still tightly clenched, to fall into my lap. 
I continued to breathe shakily for another moment and tried to get my head straight. I'm sorry, I said once I felt like I could speak without screaming. That was really not something I expected to see tonight. What the heck, Butch? Banshees are freaking real? And they come in here every night for this pharyngitis treatment? What the heck is this place? I realized my voice was starting to gain volume again. I stopped, swallowed, and took another raspy breath. Sorry, I said again. I've never reacted well when I get really scared. Believe me, I wish that didn't happen to me, but... The thing, still clasped in my hand, suddenly lurched. I curiously glanced down, only just then fully noticing what I had been clenching in my fist. Dude, this is a monkey's paw, isn't it? Yeah, you might want to put that down before you make another wish, said Butch, an amused smile on his face. Why? What did I say? Still scared? Of what? Oh, right, ugly banshee chick. Nah, I'm good now. Why do my pants smell bad? Butch rolled his eyes. Go ahead and grab a new pair. No charge. Nice. Can I use your bathroom? He nodded towards the far wall in the shop. Purple door. I'd avoid opening any others if I were you. Spoil sport. Is that elevator real? Yep, and no. I'm not answering any follow-up questions until I can't smell you anymore. Ten minutes later, I was feeling much cleaner, if slightly chilly, in my newly bought I'm a stupid t-shirt and newly gifted booty shorts. I must have been starting to grow in Butch because, other than another twitch of his mouth and slight shake of his head, he didn't much react to my change in style. So, you're actually just straight human, aren't you? He asked, ruefully. I can't think of another species that would so flagrantly disregard their own self-respect. You've never seen the video of the otter assaulting a decapitated fish head, have you? You know what I mean. Even the blood folk will still show up in something tailored, at least. Butch, you just had a floating girl in here wearing funeral clothes. Versace, Mave's taste is old-fashioned, but always quality. I paused with my mouth open before shutting it slowly. Alright then, I guess I stand corrected. Should I change so I don't offend the blood folk? I finally got a full laugh from Butch. What's your name, kid? Clear. Sorry? Clear. Middle name is Water. My parents were hippies, also big fans of revivals. Man, thought I drew the short straw when it came to names, but you got me beat. So what? The shop bell rang again. Unlike with the previous customer, I felt not even the slightest twinge of fear as the latest monster strolled casually into the building. Six and a half feet tall and covered in reddish brown fur, the man with overtly canine face was sporting a cordial grin. The werewolf nodded casually at Butch and began strolling the aisles. Butch nodded back and then raised an eyebrow at me as though interested in my newfound stoicism. Well? He asked, as if unsure whether or not I was going to crap myself again. I can't believe you gave me a hard time about my booty shorts and then didn't blink at the guy dropping werewolf dawn. Butch grunted in satisfaction. Guess that monkey's paw was the real deal. I should bump up the price. You didn't know? He shook his head. It's good policy not to mess around with a monkey's paw. Had a feeling it was legit, though. A lot of the other stuff we got from that particular estate ended up being pretty extraordinary. There was a pause. Such as? I demanded. Come on, dude. You can't drop that line and then not show off a bit. Butch laughed again and turned around to the display wall behind the counter. He pulled down a shadow box and laid it on the counter in front of me. Inside was an almost cartoonishly large revolver, six chamber but with a bulbous barrel that could have fired a ski ball. There were three huge rounds already loaded but with no caliber that I recognized. You seem like the kind of guy who would appreciate this. He opened the case and gestured for me to pick it up. I did immediately, surprised by its apparent weightlessness. I spun it around my finger, gunslinger style, and leveled it around harmlessly towards the doors at the end of the hall. The werewolf glanced up at me curiously for a moment before returning to his shopping. I love the way it handles, but I don't recognize the make. One of a kind, Butch said. They call it the checkoff gun. I laughed. Seriously? Guess I have to fire it then, huh? Probably, but I wouldn't waste the ammo if you don't have to. Those three rounds are all there are left. How very hackneyed. I said, examining one of the rounds. These things seem a bit unnecessary, unless you're hunting kaiju. What are they? I've just taken to calling them guffins. I've only seen it used once, during a debate over the bathroom being only for paying customers. One thing led to another, and a full army of vampires ended up laying siege to the shop. Had to have been at least four or five hundred of them. Hal shot off a round from this and it fired an actual sun. Gave me second degree burns on every exposed inch of skin. But it fried every last one of those beasts. Wait, it shoots a sun? I asked incredulously. 
cautiously setting the gun back on the counter. No, it shoots whatever it has to get the job done. Butch explained. That makes no sense whatsoever. You do realize there's a werewolf browsing through old Megadeth CDs ten feet behind you, right? And turned around and locked eyes with the large hairy fellow for a moment. His tongue lolled out of the side of his mouth in a wolfish smile, and he winked at me. I mean, I get what you're saying, but I still think there's a big difference between ancient legends and a relatively modern literary construct. Butch opened his mouth to respond, but at that moment, the door slammed open with enough force to cause the lights to flicker. I glanced over my shoulder at the darkened doorway, noticing Butch's hand move to rest lightly on the Chekhov gun on the counter. The werewolf's hackles raised as a low growl began to rumble from his direction. The man in the doorway seemed human, if high-stake lawyers could be considered human, that is. He was tall, but not intimidatingly so. His suit was well tailored, his hair immaculate. The charming smile on his face belied the cold contempt in his eyes. Hey, Butch, he said, his voice a purring baritone. Hey, ass. Long time no see, Butch replied, his face devoid of emotion. Way too long. The man pulled the coin from his pocket and began rolling it back and forth across his fingers. Is your boss around? You know I haven't seen Hal in months, as not since that incident with the purgatory delegation. Paychecks are still rolling in, though, so he's out there somewhere. If you find him, let him know I'm taking the fender for a Christmas bonus. As shook his head in faint disappointment. It really would be in your best interest to help me track him down, Butch. You know the deal he made to run this place expired at the end of last month. Now my employer has a lot of respect for the old man, and everything he's done over the years so he's more than willing to renegotiate the terms. Butch shook his head. You're not hearing me, as I don't know where the guy is, and I don't have any way of getting a hold of him. Come on, you really mean to tell me your boss can't suss out where he is? I'm starting to get why his little rebellion failed. Still not sure how he duped all you idiots into following his lead, though. Was that like a Trump thing? As his eyes narrowed. That's low, even for you, Butch. I laughed involuntarily. I don't know, man, if the MAGA hat fits. Suddenly, a force slammed into me, hurling me over the counter and against the wall behind the register. Shock shuddered through my body as a display hook pierced my shoulder. A flood of moisture spread down my back, and I immediately started feeling a little woozy. Also a lot pissed. I jerked my head up to glare at Az. Man, I just bought this shirt. I felt myself reverse direction, flying off the wall and across the store. I flailed painfully as I soared managing to tip over one of the racks before colliding with the werewolf. I couldn't help but marvel at how soft he was as we hit the floor and slid into another rack, bringing its contents down on us. I always envisioned werewolf fur as being more coarse, I thought, as I waited out the falling inventory. Sorry, Jack, I muttered, rolling away from the werewolf and painfully climbing to my feet. Cool if I call you Jack, never caught your actual name. Jack growled, shaking his head like a wet dog. I don't know why you have to make me hurt your friends before you tell me what I want to know, Butch. You know how much it pains me to hurt innocent bystanders. Butch was levitating over the cash register, his limbs shaking violently as he appeared to reflexively attempt to swallow his own tongue. I started grabbing anything within reach and throwing it at Az. I managed to score a direct hit with a tea kettle and an old computer mouse, but it was the lawn dart directly to the head that finally got his attention. Butch took in a raspy breath and fell to the ground as Az's head spun around to glare at me. His hand shot up and I felt my windpipe close. My hands instinctively went to my neck as I tried desperately to take an air. Idiot child, harassed Az, his eyes appearing a dull red as the edges of my vision began to darken. Do you have any idea who you're? I lost the rest of his sentence as Jack launched himself into Az and the two of them flew into another rack. I fell to my knees, sucking in air, and letting the world come back into focus. It sounded like Jack got one or two good swipes in him with his vicious looking claws before he flew backwards again, crashing through one of the doors at the back of the store. What lay beyond remained unknown, as the door immediately reformed behind him, pulling back in its shattered wood until no trace of damage remained. As his head came bobbing back into sight over the racks, I got back to my feet. This whole lack of fear thing was really starting to grow on me. You can force choke me all you want, Vader. I snarled at him. We all know you're just a whiny little sand-hating baby. As his face was filled with fury as he raised his hand to smite me again. Suddenly, Butch stepped between us, the checkup gun leveled, squarely, at Az's head. Az's look turned to one of contempt, but his hand still lowered slightly. How many of those bullets are you down to, Butch? He asked. Two? Three? Are you sure you really want to waste one on little old me? 
What then will you use on the one he sends after me? Or the one after that? Eventually, the big man himself will want to come. Better hope you still have at least one left for him. My eyes fell onto another gun that had fallen on the floor in the struggle. One that I had noticed on my first walkthrough of the aisles. A stupid idea popped into my head. I reached down and grabbed it, cocking it loudly as I leveled it towards Az. Step aside, Butch! I growled. Butch shot a look back at me, saw what I held, and gave me a tight grin as he lowered the checkup gun and stepped out of my way. I squeezed the trigger on the Super Sucker XP-100 and sent a stream of water directly into Az's face. His scream was piercing as the smoke immediately started pouring off his melting face. I stepped towards him, continuously pumping more water as I adjusted my stream to any piece of exposed skin his squirming left exposed. Flesh fell from the demon's bones like really good barbecue ribs, bubbling into vapor from the floor. His screams became so high-pitched that I heard a few of the more delicate glass items in the shop shatter. I didn't let up on the stream of water until the plastic toy lost pressure and dribbled into a stop. As collapsed, his clothes falling into a pile on the floor as his body steamed away. I stood panting, feeling the adrenaline burning off my skin. My shoulder, forgotten during the fight, began to throb painfully as a squirt gun slipped from my grasp. Did you seriously just use a Pulp Fiction line on me? I looked up at Butch in surprise and started to laugh. <laughs> I mean, how often am I really going to have an opportunity like that? I just couldn't resist. He chuckled along with me. How'd you know that Super Soaker would work? You made it pretty easy to figure out what he was with all that boss's rebellion talk. And I thought with the kind of crap you have in here, there was a pretty decent chance that thing was filled with holy water. Anyway, if it wasn't, I knew you'd probably just look at me like I was an idiot and shoot him with a checkup gun instead. So, you know, what the heck? He chuckled again and walked over to me to examine my shoulder. How's it look? I asked, through gritted teeth. I mean, you're gonna need stitches, probably, but I don't think you're gonna bleed out anytime soon. I nodded, then glanced over at the back of the shop towards the door Jack had disappeared through. Is he gonna be alright? I asked. Jack? He replied. Yeah, he'll be fine. He's a pretty solid guy, has friends everywhere. I'm sure someone over there will put him up until he finds his way back. Holy crap, his name's actually Jack? I thought I was just being clever. Nobody knows his real name, actually. He doesn't talk much, but most people end up landing on that joke eventually, so it's kind of just stuck. Now, my self-esteem, I deadpanned. What's over there? Over where? You said someone over there will put him up. What's over there? Oh, that door leads to the back rooms. It opens up somewhere different every time, so you usually have to find another way back if you go through it. I nodded, not really understanding, but increasingly distracted by the radiating pain in my shoulder. Well, let me know next time you see him. I think I owe that guy a beer. Next question. Where's the nearest hospital? He grinned. Come on, I'll patch you up. Gotten pretty good at it over the years, working this job. Only lost a couple dozen patients. I shook my head and followed as he led to another door behind the cash register. He stopped, with his hand on the knob. Oh, and uh, remember how I was trying to figure out why you ended up finding this place? I think I figured it out. Want a job? I looked at him. I thought about the banshee, and the monkey's paw, and the werewolf, and the demon. Then, I thought about the long series of dead-end, boring jobs I'd had up until this point. Do you have a dental plan?